please don't um, ruin it for the rest. Um, so what I'm showing you here is a video with two images, and I'm switching bet between the two images. Um, they're basically the same image, but one part of the image is changing between the two. And don't point to it or say it loud, because you'll ruin it for the rest. Um, how many people can see the difference between the two images? It's about one twentieth of the images changing in front of your eyes. One twentieth of the image, and it's something that airplanes need in order to fly. Okay, more people start. So with the clue helps, not everyone has seen it yet. If I say engine, most people should see it. Right? Airplane engine, I can now point to it to make it easier. And as you can see, over here, in one image the engine is there and the other one it isn't. Okay. And you might think that this is just a trick in that your attention is being distracted and you're not being able to actually see the engine because there's other things in the image that are distracting you. Um, and indeed, that is what a lot of people do. That's essentially change blindness. Um, the next video will illustrate that the problem is much bigger and will also illustrate why you should close your laptops during this lecture. Okay, so I'm going to um, just basically click on this and I will let you... Um, um, follow the instructions. All right, so what changed? A sign. Okay. What else changed? A person disappeared. Got darker. That's a good one. Oh, you're the first person in, I think, three years that I've been using this that's not just that. A whole building changed. Okay, note there's, so the few things that were pointed out as signs, um, note that this door is now green. Something weird, the wrought iron here is broken and there's a door up there. What's a door doing up there? Is it for people to walk out and jump off the balcony? <laughs> and this building is pink. Let's click somewhere and see what the original was. <laughs> This whole building changed. There was a person here. Someone noticed the sign changing. There were windows with iron. The door was brown, not green. And many other things changed. These are just some of them. Um, a lot of people think that I cheat when I do that, when I do this. So I'm going to play this again one more time. And if you look at the building, you can see the building changing now. If you focus on it, you'll see that it's changing. But the problem is you're too focused on the building, seeing it change, and you're not seeing the changes that are happening elsewhere. Okay? No matter how much you believe you can attend and do two things at the same time, you can't. So if you have your laptop there, don't fool yourselves that you can keep a conversation with your friends and attend to this lecture because you can't. You're wasting your time. <laughs> yeah. um, and the visual system is just like that. Um, so what's going on? We have this belief that we have an image of the world in our heads, that we're seeing this all. But we're not, as I've already proven to you with the last two videos. It was, it's an illusion that you're seeing it all, but you're really not seeing it all. Uh, moreover, the reason in the last experiment why you don't see it all is because there's a limited buffer. 
There's a limited visual buffer. You can, per second, you see in high resolution something that's the size of your thumbnail at this distance. And you see it about three or four times. Okay? That's all you see. The rest is a confabulation of your mind. And let me show you um, a video that actually shows what you... Um, this is now using an eye tracker, so these days it's very cheap to get eye trackers. And so we can actually uh, look at what someone is you know, using an eye tracker with a camera and also uh, monitoring where the retina is. Uh, we actually can tell where the person is looking at in a scene. And so, and when, you, when you're home and you're making yourself a peanut butter sandwich, um, this is essentially what you're looking at. You might think that you're seeing the whole scene, but you're just using your eyes as slaves to complete the task. No, you, look, you read the labels, <laughs> your eye pays attention to the edge of the jar and the hand grip, because that's what you care about. You don't want the peanut butter to come off, and you don't want to drop this thing. So you, your eyes are being used for motor control. I hope you all had lunch. <laughs> and so, when, when this individual pours water, um, we'll pay attention to the edge of the glass, because that's all that you care about. You don't, don't want to spill water. Um, and so on. And seen as a retinal image. Here is a, another demo that sort of shows, again, the, where they've monitored a subject looking at an image. Um, and this is essentially the foveations. And this is really what you see. Something in high resolution. You have this huge hole in the middle called the blind spot. Just proof that you're not seeing it all. There's a huge blind spot there that your brain is filling it. You wouldn't know that it exists. Pretty amazing. All right, why am I showing you all this? Uh, not just to make you feel a sense of bewilderment in the world. And, um, but it's just to show you that you don't know how you see. Okay. Now comes the question. If we don't know how we see, how can we tell machines to see? Okay. And so the whole idea of programming with ifs and fors and all these constructs comes to the ground because you don't know how to tell a machine to see. Instead, we're going to take a different approach, and that's the machine learning approach, where instead of um, giving an algorithm, giving a machine instructions on how to see, uh, we're going to just present it with examples and let it figure out what it is to see. And I'll be more concrete about that um, soon. Now, it seems extremely daunting <coughs> to be able to see. I will now ask you um, the following. Which of these images looks more like a jumping spider? You know the little jumping spiders that go around in the garden and jump. You get them all over the place. And I'm going to have people doing hands up to see um, how, well you, how good you are at recognizing a jumping spider. So you get to only vote for one of these. So how many people think this is the best sort of uh, image of a jumping spider? Anyone for one? One person? For this guy, how many people? L let me record the votes. Oops, I left a pen actually. Um, how many people for this one? We have about one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. This guy. 
but six, this guy, three, this guy here, we have one, two, three, four, five, this guy, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. So this guy is winning for some reason. This guy, four, five, six, and what about this guy? Most people think that's a jumping spider. Okay, so that's guy is one. So now let's see. Um, so your your prediction of what a jumping spider is um, agrees with uh, the prediction of a male jumping spider. So when um, a male jumping spider was presented different pictures of a female uh, jumping spider um, in a mating procedure. Um, they, they, this was the one that caused the arousal. Okay. Um, now, this is not to just, um, this is actually intended to belittle you indeed, uh, to belittle us humans, because even a little jumping spider is capable of seeing and understanding. Something that will be extremely hard for us to, again, code uh, with an algorithm in a machine. That's a little jumping spider. It has amazing eyes. It has a long focal lenses. It has, um, you know, your 360 view, very much like the Google car that you see driving around <laughs> in Street View. Um, this is sort of the experiment where it's able to recognize not only other spiders, but it recognizes images of spiders, caricatures. Extremely hard thing to do. Um, and this is how beautiful the learning process of evolution is. That um, this is not a jumping spider, but a moth that has learned through the ages to pretend that it's a jumping spider so that the other jumping spiders don't attack it. Evolution is just a truly beautiful thing. Um, and it's a learning process that takes over uh, many years. So even small creatures, the point being that even small creatures are capable of doing, you know, with just uh, a few thousand neurons, are capable of doing things that we're not capable of doing. Um, and that's because they've learned. They've learned either through, evol through evolution, trial and error, or as we'll see with humans, we learn through um, a stage of growing up. Okay, so this lecture... Um, the, the main intent of this lecture is to first uh, motivate uh, the topic, why we need learning. Um, and I will then give you some definitions of um, uh, what we mean by machine learning, what we mean by learning. Um, I will talk about the big data phenomenon, which is something that's happening right now, and it's one of the reasons why machine learning has become so popular. Um, I'll talk about uh, neural systems and motivation, um, for uh, designing machine learning systems. And, um, and then finally, oops, sorry about that. Finally, I will talk about some applications of uh, machine learning. And there's many, many applications. Machine learning is one of the most popular things. I hope that will transpire over today and Friday. Um, and I will just cover a few. Now, everything this week is going to be like, wow. And if it's not wow, this is the wrong course for you. <laughs> um, if it's wow, then there's a warning. This is a math course. Okay. Um, the way we're, um, if you go to Google, if you go to Microsoft, and you walk through the halls, um, I took a bunch of pictures actually that I wanted to put in, in the slides to, sh to prove to you. But sadly, and it, it was real hard to take pictures in Google, but I still managed to get some. Um, but I was on a dock the other day and I was taking a picture of a jellyfish and my dog pulled and my cell phone ended in the bottom of the ocean. And I didn't back up. <laughs> so, but I will swear to you that those holes are full of boards with math. The same kind of math that we're going to learn in this course. Now, the math is not hard, and I will revise it all from the beginning. But there will be, um, the first few lectures will all be about revision of probability. There'll be revision of linear algebra and so on. Um, unlike earlier courses, first year and second year courses, you'll see how the math 
um, directly applies to the world and how we use math to do very cool stuff. But the language of machine learning is mathematics. Now, it's, it's like any other language. If, if, you, if you prepare to learn it and do cool stuff, um, in the process, it will be really enjoyable, and uh, you know, I welcome you to the course. Um, if you're the kind of person that goes to China and you hate being in China because you have to learn Mandarin, then this course is not for you either. <laughs> okay, so we want people that are excited about learning, and provided you're excited about learning, we'll do our best to um, teach you the concepts. Okay, one more example. Over here, there's a bunch of images, and, um, and I have highlighted three of the images, and I'm call, and, uh, which are tufas. So here's a tufa, and another tufa, and a third tufa. Okay? So now, how many people think that this is also a tufa? How many people think? This is a tufa. One person, good. <laughs> what about this guy? This guy. Okay, we split. Okay. Um, conclusion. Actually, let's ask a question first. Can someone tell me what a tufa is? Now someone can probably voice what a tufa is. You're all so good at telling what a tufa is and what a tufa is not. <laughs> <laughs> and you were very convinced, except for the one guy that stood up against it not being a tufa. Is it a fossil? Kind of looks like a fossil. So we're starting to get an explanation. What else is there about a tufa? It's a fairly long stem and a little thing at the top. Okay, fairly long stem and a thing at the top. Now we're starting to get into it. People are starting to try, okay, what makes a tufa be a tufa? It looks similar. It looks like a plant with a root system, a stalk, and a flower. Okay, so now we're making comparisons to other things we already know in our database, in our head. Um, to be able to tell what a tufa is. Um, now, humans are very good, just from a few examples, at learning what something is. And this, uh, God knows what a tufa is. A tufa is just some imaginary thing that uh, there's the pictures. Um, the point is we're very good at learning what a tufa is, uh, but we don't learn by describing all the details of what a tufa is. Uh, we do certainly use similarity of one thing to the other to be able to tell where a tufa is. And we just do this, what we call the inductive leap of learning. No machine is capable of doing this. Okay. Um, now, key to this, in the process, of, we're also learning features. You sort of expect a tufa to have like a stem, to have little legs, to have something at the top, based on the three examples. So. Um, automatically we are learning features that describe or properties that describe what a tufa is. Okay. That's one view of learning. One view of learning and it's all about extracting features that allows us to classify things into groups. Um, a more general sort of AI-ish view of learning is uh, as the one that Herbert Simon uh, proposed um, like think of an agent, and this agent here is a robot, but the agent could be the little spider that we've seen before. Um, the agent interacts with the environment by acting upon the environment, and it makes percepts from the environment. So it sees, it hears, it feels, um, and so on. Now, this agent has some goals. And as this agent interacts with the environment, um, the agent wants to do better. Okay? The agent wants to find better food. The agent wants to uh, find better mates and so on as it interacts with the environment. And learning is about using the, um, each interaction with the environment, um, each experience, as an opportunity to adapt 
your brain so that you can do better in the ne next time you encounter a similar task. <coughs> so indeed what you're trying to do is you're trying to look at the problem and you're trying to extract, or like in our case the two first, you're trying to extract features automatically. We do not know what those features are. This is all happening subconsciously in our case, as we saw in, when we were doing vision. Um, we're going to inspect what these features are a bit more when, when I show you some of the videos of what measurements we have from neuroscience. Um, but we're trying to extract these features, and they're hopefully features that will allow us to do predictive tasks. For example, we might want to extract the feature fangs and paws so that when we go hiking and we see big fangs and paws, we know that that feature means run or do whatever you do, whether it's a lion or a cougar or a bear. Um, let's look at some ex more examples of predictive tasks. And these are actually examples that are driving machine learning sort of big time these days. Um, energy demand prediction. So soon every household will have special meters that will know, um, you know what, how you're using your electricity um, every day. And if they do know this, then they also know how to best allocate energy. Um, th I mean, like for example, it's silly to have a generator sending a lot of power in, uh, to Vancouver at a particular time time when it would be much cheaper if you just switched your washing machine uh, five times later. So if you have a huge surge, that means that they have to switch on more equipment. But if you just went five minutes later, energy would be, say, 10, 10 bucks cheaper. And so as we need to become much more efficient with our energy use, usage, uh, being able to predict, or, or another example would be you take measurements of the weather outside um, and you have measurements of the number of people in this room because you can just put a camera with a counter at the door and based on that you would adjust the temperature of this room automatically. Okay, so you could predict what the temperature will be based on previous years, uh, the number of people that were here, the temperature and where the wind is blowing and so we would have a much more efficient uh, system to use energy. So that's very popular right now. You might want to predict the sales of a particular shirt if you're a company like Lululemon. Um, Netflix, the movie recommender, it, a lot of people vote one star, three stars for some movies, but most people have not seen all the movies in Netflix, um, and, so, and so there's a lot of missing information because people haven't rated all of the movies, and so you need to fill in that missing information. So that's a common application of machine learning. Um, Netflix, in fact, gave a prize for a million dollars a few years ago to, um, to researchers to improve their machine learning system. Um, machine learning is also useful for, if you have a model of what's normal, you can use that model to detect deviations from normality. And that's very important in the numerous applications. Like if you do environmental monitoring and you want to detect anything that's abnormal because that might indicate, well, you will have a lot of dead fish and there won't be any salmon sushi for the next five years. Um, actually, I've done consulting projects that what about that. Um, or if you're into the whole surveillance thing, you might want to detect intruders coming to your business. Um, if you're interested in this green guy at the bottom there, an HIV virus, um, you might want to detect when it mutates so that you can provide uh, um, the subject with the right drug. Classifying, it's another big application of machine learning. Um, the reason why you can just use your credit card so quickly these days is because there's a big algorithm that the moment you put in your credit card, it automatically classifies you into a risk level. And if you're not in a risky situation, you're fine. Um, if, if you are, because of whatever past record, or because you're similar to some people, created a problem, then that will classify as no credit. 
So the reason why credit cards work so efficiently and so fast is because the, the, the decision on how to classify you, whether they should give you credit or not, is done automatically by an algorithm these days. So it's a machine learning idea. Cancer diagnosis where, and any sort of, sort of medical diagnosis as we're going in the future, um, machines are better at a lot of diagnosis and prognosis than um, doctors. Ranking, um, Google hires a lot of people in machine learning because personalization in Google um, is all about machine learning. Personalization, by the way, just means learning. You're learning what the people like and giving them more of that. Summarization, which is like imagine you, you go to a website, it has um, 16,000 reviews for this movie, um, you're not going to read the 16,000 reviews. You just want to know what's the gist of it. And machine learning ideas can be used uh, to do that. And ultimately, um, decision making, um, as we'll see in the course, especially toward the end of the course, there's very good machine learning uh, techniques to enable um, robots and other agents to make decisions. Um, and decisions could be um, decisions as you might think of, not just like getting married or not getting married, big decisions, but simple decisions like what should the value of this parameter be so that my compiler runs faster? And if you can do that tuning automatically, you might save um, a lot of energy for Microsoft. I mean, remember these companies actually build their, their they put their servers next to power stations. Uh, Google consumes a lot of energy. If you can improve their computation a little bit, you're saving a lot of energy for the world. Um, oh, on the new summarization side was a product that was developed by people that were in this class. They sold it to CNN. Okay. Why would we want um, to use machine learning. Okay? Because machine learning is not a thing that you should use it all the time, but it, it makes sense in, in a few domains. Now, you want to um, give, you, you need machine learning um, in a few situations. The first is suppose that you send a robot to Mars. Now, the problem is you can't have a, a human controlling that robot because it takes about half an hour to send a turn left signal. Okay, so, so this robot will have to learn to automatically, um, if it gets stuck on a rock, turn back, turn left, try again, and learn to navigate. If, you, if it relied on a human controlling it by remote control, it would never accomplish its task. So if you to build autonomous systems that can work beyond where humans can control them, uh, we, we need automation, so we need machine learning. Um, learning is also useful as um, I motivated in the beginning of the class in applications where we can't justify how we do things, um, like seeing or hearing or feeling, um, any sort of type of perception. Language, we don't understand how we speak. Oh. Sometimes solutions change over time, and they keep changing. And because they keep changing over time, um, like if I'm learning someone's preferences, you know, a person's preferences change throughout their lives. Um, I can't just hard code a system for them. I need to have a system that will adapt um, and provide uh, assistance uh, later on as this person um, develops either developing through interests if you're in social media or, or developing through a disease in the case of an intensive care system. Um, biometrics, personalization. Um, everyone, if you want to build a system that recognizes your, um, your finger uh, uh, print, um, then you don't want to code a separate system for each person because that would take uh, at a year each, what a day each, it would take six, seven billion. 
effects. Um, and of course, some problems are just too huge. Uh, with millions of ads being, you know, there's millions of web pages out there, billions of ads, and you're trying to decide uh, where to put in millions of, actually billions of people using the internet now. Um, you have to decide where to put this ad, on what page, for what person to maximize the revenue. Okay, we live in a consumer society, and this is one of the greatest problems of our time how to deliver the right ad to the right person at the right time. You couldn't rely on humans to do this. Um, Yahoo processes millions of these per second. So. so that's when we um, use machine learning. And actually, let me actually stop here. What other examples have you seen of machine learning in your lives that have impacted you? Apps? You search for a color in Google search? Mm -hmm. Search for a color? Yeah. And what does it give you? Like images, let's say like cars that are black. Yeah, that's true. So Google already does a lot of image processing um, to be able to um, use that to give you sort of semantically similar things. GPS, mm -hmm. That's a very cool application. Um, like University of Washington, they have an amazing app where they, they use a combination of learning GPS to figure out where people are going in cities when the signal gets lost. There's lots of hands. Let's and start. <laughs> and Laura, the internet radio learns your music, tells you what you like. Pandora, brilliant example of personalization. Actually, Pandora, the way it works, is they use a human, and they use actually 20 humans, 20 musicians. Um, every time they get a new song, one of the 20 people annotates the well, song. That, that is <laughs> by hand. Oh, no, no, that's still, I, I just talked to the Pandora person a few weeks ago. Um, they still annotate it with by hand. And so that part is, they haven't figured out how to do that with machine learning. The mark, machine learning is a new thing. You guys are lucky because you, you're at the beginning of the curve. Um, but the rest of the system is automatic, you're right. The recommendation part is pretty smart. Shazam. Shazam. That's another good app there. StumbleUpon. StumbleUpon. They, I wonder if they do have machine learning. I wouldn't be surprised that they do. You know it's so fast. Oh, so much learning in Gmail. <laughs> credit, card fraud. credit card fraud, a very common example. High frequency trading. High frequency trading, it's all trading these days. Machines, some of the algorithms we're going to see in this course. Mm -hmm. Book recommendations. Sorry, I didn't. Book recommendations, Amazon. Amazon, yes. Brilliant example of a recommended system, one of the oldest. Netflix's uh, active CDN pushes um, media files to servers near you, near a certain city when they know that, say, Game of Thrones is on Sunday, so it pushes Game of Thrones to the servers around a certain city. Awesome show, by the way. <laughs> yeah, that, that's really smart. We're how we Even things that we don't see, so that's a good example, because there's things that we don't see, but they're already there. Yes, that is smart to that. Oh yes, Sebastian, I think was involved with that. Uh, I actually haven't seen an app for this, but the, a lot of doctors or healthcare is now starting to give some sort of machine learning things where they take a look at patient information records and they recommend in terms of what are the probabilities. Mm -hmm. Yes, certainly a lot of medical diagnosis stuff going on. Uh, IBM's Watson. IBM's Watson. <laughs> Stock market, Lots yeah. Mm -hmm. Targeted advertising. Target advertising. Initial navigation in this mm -hmm. it must, when, when your plane is landing, you have to hope that it's a machine that's landing it, not a human. 
algorithms are very good. at are usually better than humans at doing that sort of thing. Sensor faces and movements. Mm -hmm. Sensing faces, that's a good example. Your, each of your cameras now has like a face detection. Even the iPhone. Um, there's a panorama, uh, panorama app that uh, basically recognizes which part of the picture you need to continue to take panorama. Yeah, yeah, that's a great application. Actually, the panorama one, with like photo stitch or um, what's the other one? Basically, where it happens. Yeah, so one of the, the apps is called photo stitch and the other one is called Autism. Okay. The technology was developed here at UBC. <laughs> Uh, Facebook has a security team that uh, finds pedophiles, so people who stop other people or children, so they find them and they report to the police. I'm glad to hear that because. Uh, I'll take one more. Uh, artificial intelligence in our games. Games. There's a lot of uh, learning going into games these days. So, it's you guys are quite aware of. Um, it's really um, getting into most of the things that we use. Machine learning is built in into um, a lot of our products. Um, it's becoming recently very popular. Um, there's lots of new startups with people trying to make something out of machine learning. Um, the big companies invest a lot of money in machine learning. Companies like Google, like Microsoft, um, and so on. Um, and Academically, it's also of great interest because some of us want to ultimately understand what is intelligence um, and learning seems to be the core of answering that question. Or certainly one of the central uh, pieces. Okay, so learning has become popular also because of uh, increases in computation and increases in you know, hardware. Uh, performance and equipment. And one of the big improvements has not just been computer speed, but it's actually our ability to store and manage data. Um, these days you can buy terabyte hard drives quite easily from London Drugs. Um, and we take that for granted, but the whole Library of Congress in the United States is only 20 terabytes. That huge building with all those books, now we can just put it in a little thing of that size. Um, phone calls, um, if you record all phone calls, about 323 petabytes. Um, the state of World of Warcraft is a petabyte. Uh, Avatar is one petabyte to render it. And to put it in context, Google processes about one petabyte of uh, data per hour. YouTube video is what's very expensive, so we go, um, so for next year it'll be probably 20, 18 exabytes um, just in video traffic. And that kind of tells you that the future is video and being able to understand video and, and for that you need machine learning is sort of important. Google certainly invests a lot of money and we'll see some of their products um, in a few slides. Now, um, here is um, some remarks by um, Alan Halaby, Peter Norvik, and Fernando Pereira. Um, these are sort of big Google managers. Um, and one of them was saying that in 1967, when he was doing his PhD, um, the largest data set uh, for natural language processing was about one million words. That was regarded um, you know, 40 years ago, that was considered to be huge. One million words. By 2006, this has gone up by 10 to the 6. This is not just growing linear, this is growing. That's an exponential increase on what we can do, on what we can store, and the type of data that we can manage. Um, there's really amazing systems, Amazon Dynamo, the Google Tables. Um, there's lots of new systems that are coming up out there, um, cloud systems that allow us to just manipulate huge amounts of data very easily. So we finally are at the stage um, where uh, we can do all these amazing applications that we couldn't in the past just because we didn't have the date. 
Um, for people in language, there's been two big success stories. Um, the first one is speech recognition, and the second one is machine translation. Um, speech recognition, you get to Siri, so you know how well it works, and you know how lousy it is as well. Um, the nice advantage about speech recognition is that you say, um, I don't know, Siri, um, help me here. And if Siri doesn't understand you, you correct it. Now, every time you correct it, you're giving Google more data. Oh, sorry, um, Apple. <laughs> um, and that data will be used to improve. Okay, so the companies have, and, and Google does this, and all companies do that. They've learned how to bootstrap um, the whole process because every time you correct, you get more data. With more data, the systems get better. This is something we will actually see with mathematics in a few weeks. Uh, machine translation is also one of those things where a uh, machine translates for you, and if you don't like the translation, you can correct it. And every time you correct Google Translation for Google, Google Translation gets better. And Google Translation is an amazing product. You know, I go to web pages in foreign languages and ask for a translation, and voila, I get a translation. It's, it's really cool. It makes a lot of uh, foreign pages accessible to me all of, all of a sudden. The key to get these things to work, as the Google guys point out, is that you need lots of data, and, and in, in this case, memorization, that is just being able to record everything, um, every new example, every correction, um, is a good strategy. Now, to show you the power of data in a different setting, um, Alyosha Efforts at TMU has this cute example where he, he takes an image, and then he cuts the thing that he doesn't like in the, in the photo that he took on his um, holiday. And then he has a huge database of other images okay, that are similar to this image, that match it at some semantic level. And then he starts picking pixels from these images to reconstruct the rest of this image. Okay? And this is what he gets. So it's pretty neat. So he's able to complete um, the scene with something that looks very plausible. Um, but this is only possible when his database includes millions or possibly billions of other images. If you just have a few, it doesn't work. Now, it's also not all about data. Let's first see what Google would say. These, these three people from Google. They say they've already solved the problem, the sociological problem of getting people to give them data, basically. And we love to give our data away. We don't care about privacy. We don't care about the fact that every time we download an app, that app is sucking a lot of context, etc. Um, and we, we're unaware of it mostly, and none of us reads the 60 pages and presses, okay, I, you know, we just agree. Um, and give our data away. We give our, each of our queries away. We give all our data, and that data gets traded uh, out there. So companies have been very good at sucking our data. Privacy is a huge issue in the future of computing, and there's new initiatives, and uh, this, you know, watch that space. Privacy is big. Uh, now, they claim that they've solved the technological problem of aggregating and indexing all content, um, they as in Google. They have done a pretty good job and they continue working toward doing a good job. I don't think they've solved it. Um, and they mentioned that the problem is understanding. Okay, so the Google search engine does not understand what the web pages say, for example. They're moving toward having better understanding, but they don't have. Um, now, by increasing the data set is not going to help with that understanding either um, because quite often you have a fact that's reported on the web and it's reported the wrong way. Okay? Someone tells a lie and that lie gets propagated through many blogs and many pages and all of a sudden it becomes truth. But if you really think a bit about it and do an experiment to t check it, you realize that it's not true. So popularity alone, um, when I say data helps, 
don't interpret that as that just by growing a lie, you, you, you'll be able to learn something better. Popularity alone is not a good signal. So one example is citation matching. Um, so citation matching is when you write a book or a paper, you cite other people. And if you look at citations, often they have typos in them. And Google has not been able to fix that problem. And the reason is because um, typically what academics do is they don't really read the paper. They just grab the citation from another paper and, they, and this, the errors in the citation propagate. And so you get like uh, 200 people using the wrong citation and three or four that use the right citation. And, but if you just go by popularity, the right citation sort of dies. And for that, we need understanding. Um, so, it's, so database technology, being able to manage data, process data, is not enough. Um, ultimately, we want to get, uh, get understand what is being said. And for that, we actually need um, the type of data mining and machine learning algorithms that we'll discuss in the course. So that basically concludes the first part of the introduction. Um, in the second part of the introduction,